maybe that's a kind of crucial image for all of Annie Leibovitz's uh, photographs, that these celebrities are photographed, or if you will, painted and naked at the same time. They seem to be naked, but they're actually painted. Uh, they seem to be natural, but they're actually stylized and theatricalized. One of the things that Annie brings to any magazine photograph, really, is a kind of intense hyperrealism. Her pictures have a kind of electric energy. She brings an extra-dimensional thing to her pictures, where people seem sort of larger than life in many ways. Annie's sense of aesthetics has to do with handsome. It's not about pretty. And it's not about uh, uh, a certain surface beauty or exquisiteness. It's about very robust strength and a kind of well-balanced proportion and health, which is a very American sense of aesthetics. You know, the 80s become more conceptual and more fat and more saturated, you know, and uh, contrived and rich. And, and it's, and it's uh, it feels like the 80s before the recession, <laughs> you know. Annie's portrait of Donald and Ivana Trump was a quintessential 80s photograph, highly celebratory of celebrity glitter, really. The most interesting thing about a person can be that they're famous. And sometimes it's the least interesting thing about them. The surface can be as fascinating as the interior. And I think that the surface says a lot about our times and about the person. She's photographing these celebrities for a, for a magazine designed to, as in effect, promote them. So she automatically has a number of constraints placed upon her as an artist, the main one being that she cannot photograph them in a way that undercuts uh, our notion of who they are, our notion of their importance. So what this means is that she's essentially a, a part, of the, part of the large public relations uh, machine that these stars, that these celebrities um, have working for them and around them. You're always in a confrontational situation with publicists in regard to stars. The great thing about Annie is that Annie is her own person. And if I can get Annie accepted by the star's agent, then I know I'm going to get a great shot because Annie won't put up with any nonsense. Her interest is in getting a memorable shot, and it isn't necessarily the shot that the star would pick. It's only recently that we've had this cult of the art photographer, so that the work that Edward Steichen did for Vogue, the work that Man Ray did for Vanity Fair and Harper's Bazaar, at the time it was a way of making a living for those photographers. At a time it was seen in being in the commercial area, but once distance is brought to bear on it, it becomes a very accurate barometer of that time period and of that culture of that time. And very quickly, then, it begins to move in the can into the canon of art photography. So it's a very slippery issue. It's a very slippery issue. And I think time will tell what categories we can accurately put these into. Clearly, they're made within the context of mass culture. Sorry, that's, a little, that's scary. Sorry, I did not do that. <laughs> I think that it's a society that's totally lost its bearings in terms of what its values are, and so it's putting all its value into uh, celebrity. There's such a, a lack of, 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 of spiritual self-confidence, perhaps that uh, the achievers seem to have uh, to be the kind of the, 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 the sort of the holy, the holy cows that people worship. What we do at Vanity Fair is to use the celebrity cover image as a form of packaging, and inside we can do anything we like. There are times when the event is, is actually more exciting than the photograph, and that always sort of throws me off, like the Keith Haring photograph, for example. It's just sort of a, a little bit of light compared to what it was like to actually be there and watch him paint the room. At the end of this shooting, I asked him if he'd ever painted himself. And he said he'd be willing to try. You know, watched him paint his whole body, and it was really beautiful to see him put that 
long line on his penis to make it look longer. <laughs> and, and he stood in front of the, the backdrop. And I mean, it was just amazing because he just disappeared. He totally disappeared. He felt completely dressed and he wanted to go do something. And I suggested that we go to Times Square. So we hopped out of the car in the middle of Times Square. And no one's paying us any bit of attention. As if, you know, there was a painted man in Times Square every night. In 1987, when American Express gave her a three-year commission to produce a series of portraits for them, she found that she finally had the resources and time to bring her work to a new level of technical perfection. I brought the American Express work to such a point that I started to not like it because some of it starts to look extremely slick and, um, dare I say, you know, commercial. I mean, part of, I think, what was interesting about some of the early work is that it isn't perfect. There is mistakes in it. In the late 80s, she photographed Susan Sontag for her book, AIDS and its Metaphors. And Sontag became a close companion and mentor. She's helped me a great deal in the last few years um, in the direction of the work. You know, I think she's really responsible for, for uh, you know, my push back into the dance work and, um, uh, and, and the idea of working more, you know, for myself. I look back over the years and, and look at the work, I can see that I'm pulled back and seeing the full body uh, most of the time. You know, that um, I've always been interested in, in the form of the body. And, uh, and of course, the, the background of my mother. You know, it, it became quite natural to, uh, to be interested in dance. Oh, that's nice. me dancing. You know, my mother, uh, before she met my father, was a dancer. She took lessons from Martha Graham. It's a wonderful stripped down sense to work with, especially as a portrait photographer, because you're working with body language and, and, and sort of very raw emotional forms. And, uh, and then the dancer is expressing himself in, in a silent way with, with, his, with his body. And, um, and, it, and I think it feeds back quite nicely into you know, the portrait work. I mean, I, I look at, at how people uh, sit and, and what they do with themselves in, in a more uh, um, studied way. In 1991, Mikhail Boryshnikov and Mark Morris invited Annie to document the creation of the White Oak Dance Project in Florida. This was taken towards the end of my stay at White Oak. It's such an extraordinary idea, actually, for the dancer. You know, that they are sort of spending their lives trying to leave their feet, more or less. And what was interesting about being underwater is that they were basically set free. I'm trying to um, to work through some ideas on my own and and actually go out and, and you know self-assign myself, which is which is relatively new for for myself. But I, I I know that photography is much larger and grander than than just magazines. <laughs> but the work in general has been the assignment work for the magazines, and and I basically followed their lead. You know, I mean, first with Rolling Stone and then Vanity Fair. And it's been an interesting journey. It's interesting to see who's supposed to be the person of the moment and to record, you know, the people of our time. I'd like to try. Let's, let's get the cameraman in. Can you come in? Yeah. And we get the sound, sound man in there, too? You want them in the shot, right? Yeah. You can come in even closer. Come in even closer. But no, That's good. Way. To the side. To the side. You have to forget about getting Annie in. <laughs> so the mic in a little more. You guys get to be props now. Me? Okay. That is great. Let's hang in that for a few. Just double check my exposure, please. Okay, uh, the mic this side. It's great, it's great, it's great. <laughs> 
two lanes a little closer together, let's see. This looks incredible. Great. This is really nice. Bring, bring that camera to the side again, Mike. Just stay real tight. Stay tighter, tighter, tighter. Okay, actually, it'd be better to get the camera on the other side. Um, 